I always imagine that those categories are more in terms of should they make the investment? Is it worthwhile the investment? And GitHub Copilot is no investment. Just use it. Welcome to DevOps Paradox. This is a podcast about random stuff in which we, Darren and Victor, pretend we know what we're talking about. Most of the time, we mask our ignorance by putting the word DevOps everywhere we can and mix it with random buzzwords like Kubernetes, serverless, CICD, team productivity, islands of happiness, and other fancy expressions that make us sound like we know what we're doing. Occasionally, we invite guests who do know something, but we do not do that often since they might make us look incompetent. The truth is out there, and there is no way we are going to find it. P.S. It's Darren reading this text and feeling embarrassed that Victor made me do it. Here are your host, Darren Pope and Victor Farson. Victor, something seems a little bit different. What's different? I I don't know. It, it's almost like I can see things clearly now. <laughs> you can see or others can see you. Oh, maybe that's it. Maybe others can see us. So if you're <laughs> listening to us like you have for the past 200 and however many episodes up until this point, we haven't done video, at least not from a YouTube perspective. So we're experimenting. We're not doing this for everything right now, but we're going to do experiments for this episode and one other episode. And the order may be switched up. So, you know, just sort of go with us on this. This is something Victor's been beating on me for quite a while. Do you realize how strange this sounds to people listening to the audio podcast? I know, exactly, because <laughs> they're not watching it. But if for some reason you actually want to watch this, and this one especially you might want to watch, because we're going to be showing some stuff on screen, if everything magically works. It should. So we'll see how it goes. And by the way, before we get much into it, I want to thank today's sponsor. That is Barbaro Moho. It is a Cuban hot sauce. We'll talk more about them later. So... Just at the front end, we'll go ahead and thank them to make sure everybody else is happy. ThoughtWorks recently published their most recent tech radar back in April, May timeframe. Just really sort of near term by the time you're watching this. And if you've never looked at the ThoughtWorks tech radar, you probably should if you're doing what we do. And it breaks things up into four things. Techniques, tools platforms and languages and frameworks. And then there's four levels of each of these. Adopt, trial, assess, and hold. We're going to talk about a couple of the adopts today that I thought were interesting. Plus, we'll talk about one of the overriding themes. And again, if you're watching this on YouTube, they have a theme to declare or to program. Oh, we're going to fight. I think so. I think so. I, okay. I think I know where you land, and I, I'm pretty confident where I land for a good number of things. Not everything, but a good number of things. So let's go ahead and take a look real quick at the techniques section right now. And if, you, if you're watching along, or if you're just listening... The adopt section is in the center of the circle. These are concentric circles that build out. We're only focusing on the innermost circle for this podcast today. So there's dependency pruning. Let's take a look at dependency pruning. Do you even know what that is? I can guess. I did not go through the report, but I'm guessing, hey, what to do with all those libraries that you've been adding throughout the years and you don't need? It's actually different than that. No? Okay. But, but it's a variation of that. So what it is, is starter kits and templates usually have a bunch of dependencies. So if you're using like Spring Start or whatever to where you get the whole thing, now you have this nice quick starter kit. I'm sure there's a, a variation of that for Go. Am I correct? Yeah, those those starter kits that... We can talk about Go. Go is slightly different. But uh, you're referring to those starter kits that start with whole internet and then... Some, right? Correct. Correct. <laughs> so pruning those things back. Well, how do you get around dependency pruning? Don't use the starter kits. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or make starter kits. 
if you're having more than one application, your second, third, fourth application that is following the same pattern as previous ones should probably start with your own starter kit. Kind of, come on. You can do it. Yep. With Maven, you can create your own archetypes. With Go, you would just do a new template, I guess. Yeah. There's variations of all sorts of different ways to do this. Exactly. So dependency pruning, that's a good thing. And we should have been doing this all along. This is in the adopt circle, by the way. Should have been doing this anyway. You don't need the extra things. You're exposing yourself to security risks, potentially. You're bloating whatever your distributable is, whether that's a container image or a zip file or whatever it is. Oh, yeah. Just you don't need it. So anyway, that's dependency pruning. Now, I'm also, if you're, if you're looking at this or watching this, it's going to make sense. But when you take a look at the sections here, this dependency pruning actually moved into a dot this year. So it's basically a circle with another circle around it. There's too many circles in this. <laughs> I wish they would do something else because when you're trying to explain this for people only listening, they're not going to get it. So you actually have to see it. So that one moved into adopt this year. The other one that moved into adopt is CI CD infrastructure as a service. SAS, I'm assuming. Yeah. SAS, right? So yeah. they, they talk about GitHub Actions, Azure DevOps, GitLab, CI CD, you know, all fill in the blank uh, for whoever else is got a SaaS going on right now. I like how they do this though. There's common advantages and there are trade-offs. What's the biggest trade-off money? Cost, I'm guessing, right? That would be my guess is going to be hard cost because usually everything is billed at a build minute, right? That's usually the, the granularity. Well, and the size of whatever worker or runner that you're using. My rule of uh, excluding now the cases where you cannot use SaaS for one reason or another, right? You cannot do it. But when you can, to me, the rule is very relatively simple. Use SaaS when it becomes mature enough, right? So when somebody, something just appears, imagine, let's say, Kubernetes first couple of years. You don't want SaaS for that. You don't want that as a service simply because it's so new. Everybody's experimenting. You cannot be married to a service that is so new. But once things become more mature, then service starts making much more sense. Now they get into what was interesting is you won't necessarily get out of the box security because you're using managed services. That makes sense, right? Because it's just a managed service. So then you still need to set up zero trust. That's not always the simplest thing to do. It's the right thing to do, but it's not the simplest thing to do. Yep. Yeah. You realize people are hearing you open up your cans, right? Yes, that was me. Op For those of you not looking at the screen, but listening to audio, that was me opening a can. Yes. I tried to be silent, but failed. It's not possible. Not, not possible. Not possible. No. Again, it feels like we're starting all over again, back at episode <laughs> one. Uh, that's okay. Again, we're testing things. So from, from an adopt perspective, and there are two other items that were adopt, but those were the two, dependency pruning and CI CD as a service were the ones that came in this year as new adopts. And I think those are good ones to do. The existing ones, just for history, one is applying product management to internal platforms. That one's been there. Yeah. Nothing surprising. And then finally, uh, number four was run cost as architecture fitness function. What the heck does that mean? Uh, let's just say that's where we get into cost management. What's been the buzzword on the Kubernetes FinOps. side of this? FinOps. FinOps. Thank you. FinOps. FinOps. Everything is FinOps now. Everything was yeah. FinOps. Now it's AI. Well, no, it's still FinOps. How much FinOps are we going to have to do with AI? All of it, everything will be done by AI. That's going to be the promise around the end of the year of every single vendor, everything AI. But how can you trust an AI to run your FinOps operation? Because if AI is writing the checks. You can find it out only after you buy the license of that product. I have a feeling that will show up over time. <laughs> I'll just but there, I'll put it there, there is one thing that confuses me. Only one? I mean, in how technology rather is 
organized, right? There are things that are new and there are things that were there before, right? But obviously, like if you look at adopt, there were more things to adopt throughout many years that TechRadar is releasing than those two. So if they're not new, how do they select what stays there? If you understand what I mean. I, I understand. And what's interesting, if you if you take a look at it, you'll also see a moved in or out. But I don't see anything moving out, at least the way I read this, because with just the partial circle here, it looks oh, like it's moving. It, it, it feels nine. directional, right? Like number nine is a feels like it's headed towards adopt. Not It didn't come out of adopt. So I don't see anything moving out of anything, at least yeah. for technology. Anyway, I think there would it would be great if actually there would be addition of the radar with that kind of the full set of recommendations, not only those from I don't know this couple of photos or whatever the criteria is, how long they keep keep something in it. And I didn't do the math to figure everything out from the previous number of radars. Again, this is number twenty eight. I did not want to go out back and do a diff from one to twenty seven. I just didn't want to. Okay, let's go over to platforms. Oh. Now these were sort of interesting. So this one moved in. K3S moved in as a platform. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's massive. It's huge. It's much bigger than many people understand. It's a distribution that skyrocketed over, I mean, not overnight, but very, very fast. Basically, it's, it's almost the only choice for anybody who wants lean Kubernetes. And that that is especially important if you're talking about low power devices, edge or whatever people call it now. And that's what they go into here. Also, WebAssembly. Oh dear, what's going to go on with WebAssembly? Where is, don't tell me that WebAssembly is an adopt. It's not, right? It's not, not yet. Okay, okay, you scared me for a moment. No. We'll get there in a minute. We'll get there in a few minutes. <laughs> but they're just calling out that K3S can run WASM workloads easily. Probably that, right? Yes. Yes. I mean, it could. It's more like it could. It's not really. Uh, I think that, that that's a bit misleading. Yes, you can run WASM in K3S or any Kubernetes in the cluster, but uh, then it will be very much disconnected from the rest of the ecosystem and you will have a lot of trouble with storage networking, uh, logging this or that. It's not work. It's not serving the same scope as, as a pod, right? So yes, you can run it. That's technically correct. And then the other item that was an adopt, not surprising was GitHub Actions. Yep, GitHub Actions, it's uh, the fact that it, it is part of GitHub gives it very, very strong adoption, right? It's not really the question whether it's good or bad. It's more a question that is there. It's just there. Uh, looking at 23 uh, was contentful, headless CMS. Most people doing what we do, probably as far as we would go, is just integrate with it. And off we go. That's not our day job. Yeah. I do want to take a look at a couple of the trials, though. So trial okay. is the concentric circles headed out from adopt. So that means you should go ahead and start testing it out now, but don't necessarily adopt it, right? You should be actively trialing it. The other is assess. It'd be like, okay, do you have time over the holidays to do something? You want to do something fun? That's the assess to me. That's the way I think about it. So for trial, there's a bunch of Apache projects that are here doing ARM in the cloud, some database stuff. This is so depressing that I don't know about the most of them. Well, and but that's this is platforms though. Part. It's platforms though. So that I think that's okay. Yeah. I think once we, once we get over to tools and languages and frameworks, that'll change. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, in fact, if we go back to techniques before we actually head over to those, uh, just taking a look at a couple of the trials there, we have annotations, we have low code platforms, demo front ends for API only products, right? These are just general things. Verifiable credentials, though, that's interesting because 
that's always a good thing to have. Yeah. Okay. So we've looked at sort of the left half of the circle. We looked at techniques. We looked at platforms. And now, a word from our sponsor. I can have a Coke while you're reading, right? You can. We'll, we'll leave this <laughs> in. And by the way, uh, this ad copy, I will have to read. So hopefully there might be some music under this. I don't know. Let's see how it plays out once you actually listen oh, to this. We can remove yes. you from a screen while you read so it doesn't look weird and I can do like... You can do... Uh, yeah, you can do dances. You. Yeah, there you go. That's it. So I had to take this line. So I, I was talking to the guys at Barbara Moho and they, they sent over some ad copy and I, I tweaked it up a little bit, but I did leave some stuff in. And this first line is one of those first things. Are you ready to spice up your life while optimizing your DevOps infrastructure? See what we did there? Meet Barbara Moho, the delicious Cuban hot sauce with a kick that's sponsoring today's episode. Barbara Moho brings the heat with her unique Cuban marinade, Moho base, adding an unforgettable flavor to your favorite dishes. With flavors like El Habanero, Alabo, Panazzo, and Best Day Ever. Come on, the last name? Couldn't you have made it harder for me to pr pronounce? Because the first three were hard to do. There's a perfect match for everyone's taste buds. As a DevOps Paradox listener, you're entitled to an exclusive 25% discount on your first order. Just visit barbaromoho.com and use the promo code DevOps25 that's DevOps, the number two, and the number five at checkout to claim your discount. Check this out. Not only are these hot sauces gluten-free and vegan, think about it, you're gonna be putting this stuff on meat. So gluten-free and vegan. <laughs> I love it, I love it. <laughs> hey, it also works, I'll, I'll get to it in a second, but they're also perfect for spicing up your work from home lunches or adding an extra kick to your weekend barbecue. Let me tell you something. This morning I had breakfast and I broke out the bottle of Halibut. No, what is this? Yeah, this is Halibut. I made a bowl of grits. Victor, you probably don't even know what grits is. I have no idea what you're talking about. That's fine. I put this stuff on the grits. I tell you what, it was near life changing. So trust me, you don't want to miss out on this chance to taste the best Cuban hot sauce out there. So go ahead, order your bottle of Barbara Mojo today. And remember to use the promo code DevOps25, that's DevOps, the number two and the number five, to get 25% off your first order. The link to Barbara Moho is down in the description. I'm actually freak about those things. I love it. And when I come for Chicago, assuming that it doesn't ship to Europe, I'm going to order a few. Or make you order it for me or something like I, that. I can do that. We can figure out a way to get it to Chicago. And now back to the rest of the show. Thanks to Barbara Moho. For anybody listening or watching, sorry that was long, but I had to talk about grits. Come on. I'm from the South. It's all about the grits. Okay. Let's get back to tools. This one, I think both of us will get into, but then the very there's only one tool to adopt, and it's called DVC, like Delta Victor Charlie. What I had to go it? look it up. What is it? So let's take a look at it. It is a Git-based tool for data scientists. That explains why I don't know about it. Exactly. We need to get our friend Dave on, who is a data scientist that works at a couple of very cool places. Well, he only works at one cool place, but he's worked at cool places. And he's a, a nerd. We need to talk to him about how this even works. Because some of us will have to deal with it. But this, this is what, like there's a phrase here I'd never seen before. Continuous delivery for ML. CD, the number four ML. That's just wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's don't, don't go co-opting the CI and the CD stuff from us. You yeah. know, people just don't do it. I'll tell you what, if anybody needs good processes, automated processes, it's the data scientists. Yeah. I'm guessing that it's still software. I mean, I'm not into data science, so I'm probably completely wrong in what I'm going to say. But to me, that sounds like it should use the same processes like any other software science, right? I think so. There's no reason not to. It's just weird to mix data with continuous anything. But it shouldn't be, right? That should be normal. 
I mean, okay. Data data generation is probably as continuous as anything can get. It's coming all the time. Is it faster than continuous? Is that even possible? It's yeah, it's coming uh, from the future. Mm. In the past, correct? It's coming from the future in the past. Okay. Anyway, so that's the only thing from a tool perspective that was marked as adopt. Now, there are a handful of things that are marked as trial. And again, we'll, we'll take a look at trial here. Get leaks we've actually talked about before. That's looking for secrets that you may have leaked into your Git repositories. They're talking about the, the one specific project called Get Leaks. But there's other tools out there to do it. In fact, GitHub has built-in things for it now. Right? Get. Yep. I mean, it's almost a no-brainer. Just use it. Just use something. What I'm very surprised is actually the Helm file is in trial, kind of. If you haven't tried Helm files by now, you're too late. <laughs> like, it's been around for so long. It's been around since Helm. I mean, not two, long right? after Helm. Yeah. Huh? Was did it? Didn't it? Was it in Helm one or was it only in Helm two? I'm not sure anymore. But it's been around for a long, long time. But that's the point, right? We can't remember how long it's been. Exactly. So it, it's interesting. Kubeflow is here. Yep, it should be. And there's a bunch of other things here that I don't know anything about. The Terraform cloud operator. That's very interesting. Yeah. Truffle hog. I know. Oh, it's a SAST. Okay. I couldn't remember what it was. Again, I'm telling you, man, I'm depressed. I, I don't know about most of the tools in any category. Yeah. Or processes well, or whatever it is. It's because, well, okay, so assess. Number 72 in the assess for here is GitHub Copilot. Oh, yeah, baby. But to, to me, that's 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 a no-brainer, right? Because I understand whether you should adopt or trial or assess or hold on something that impacts your production that requires human effort to implement that you don't want to waste and so on and so forth, right? But kind of things like GitHub Copilot, what's there to trial? Just use it. And if you don't like, then stop using it, right? But I always imagine that those categories are more in terms of should they make the investment? Is it worthwhile, the investment? And GitHub Copilot is no investment. Just use it and remove it if you don't like it afterwards, right? The only investment is a bit of money that you need to pay to GitHub, so. But well, on the enterprise side, it's actually quite pricey. Is it? Oh, I'm ashamed. I don't know the pricing of Copilot. If it's just me and you, as individuals, it's pretty reasonable, like $60 a year. N not a big deal. Again, Makes I know sense. you're special, you already have it. But enterprise is different. And that, that can add up, especially if you've got a large stack of people to do. Now, the question is, and it's not in here because I believe it's just too new, was AWS Code Whisperer, which we've talked about as well before, which was free. Right? There's no cost to use it, which we still probably need to do a bake-off between the two. Given that uh, it's all about code and one owns the code of the whole planet and the other one hardly any, I don't think I need to try it to make a decision. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll I'll agree to disagree. <laughs> I'll, I'll agree. What is this? I am live. Let's see what this is. Oh, it's I am policies. Okay, that that makes sense. Kubernetes external secrets operator useful. Yes. Cube shark. Yes. Yes. Move yes. More to uh, adopt. adopt. <laughs> yes. Yesterday, move it to adopt. Is that what you're? Yes. Wanting? Exactly. Why are you so excited about that? Because it's effectively the only viable uh, and uh, robust solution for managing secrets that is not limited to a single vendor, right? We can now speak whether that's better or worse than, let's say, Vault Operator. But if you're looking into secrets, simply managing secrets coming from wherever, no doubt, that's the best solution there. And I say adopt simply because my, my, my reference for whether to adopt something or not is not only based on how 
good and robust and production ready something is, but also whether there is any alternative. If there is no alternative, then it's adopt, right? And there aren't many, if any, at least within Kubernetes ecosystem. One other one that we may know is CubeShark. Let's see, what is that? Oh, API Traffic Viewer. It was Mizu. I didn't know Mizu. So CubeShark, I have heard. So, But again, that's still in the trial phase. Oh, and this was the interesting thing too about tooling. There's nothing in the hold section. Everything is assess, trial, or adopt. Let's get to the last section. Languages and frameworks. You're going to cry. Adopt. PyTorch and the Gradle Kotlin DSL. I don't know what Gradle Kotlin DSL is. I know what Kotlin is, and I know that everybody loves it. So I understand that part. What is Gradle Kotlin DSL? I have no idea. Well, let's take a look at it because I haven't read it yet. So instead of using Groovy, if you think about the build.gradle file, it was mm -hmm. more of a Groovy syntax. Now they're saying use the Gradle Kotlin DSL instead of the Groovy stuff. Kind of, if you're into Kotlin, it makes perfect sense, of course. Yeah. And then PyTorch, obviously, is machine learning and all the machine learning stuff. Yeah. Okay. So those two don't excite us at all. Let's see if there's anything in the trialing that makes us even interested. I'm looking at it. I'm staring at it. I have no clue what any of these things are. So Jetpack are Android things. Micro or ORM is a TypeScript. Okay, moving on. Oh, no, that actually looks pretty interesting. An open source scientific and technical publishing system. But again, it's for the data scientists. Maybe we're in a wrong profession, darling. I, well, there's probably a high probability of that. <laughs> Stencil. What is that? Oh, a library to create reusable, again, TypeScript. What is that? I don't know. And then uh, Static Data Vault and Vitest. What are this has to be a testing tool, I would hope. Uh, again, JavaScript. Uh. <sighs> JavaScript. We can like it, we can dislike it, but it's here it's to there. stay. Yeah. It's until Vasm takes over. Well, and that's what I was trying to get to down <laughs> here in the assess. Let's see, because again, much like what we saw over in tools, there's nothing in the hold for languages and frameworks. .NET some Flutter things, Langchain, which I actually looked at last week, at least as we're recording this. It's for building applications with LLMs. That's gonna be happening more and more. I'm still not seeing anything here that makes me go, hmm. It just, sorry, it just doesn't. We're not writing code as much as before. And I'm definitely not writing JavaScript or TypeScript. <laughs> or I, I rarely write it. There's, I have one project I do on that. So anyway, that's the quick overlook of what's going on with the technology radar. Now, I'll put the link to that down in the show notes, or if you're on YouTube, it would be down in the description. But I want to talk about this one thing. And you can download a PDF, which actually goes into the whole thing about this. To declare or to program, where do you land? The final output should be declarative. Whether you get to that final declarative output by writing directly dec in declarative format or by using programming language to get to it is of lesser importance. Is that the answer you expected? That is a much more polite answer than I was expecting. So let me explain. I want to see what your intents are somewhere in Git, right? And I cannot see that by looking at somebody's Go code. I cannot do that, right? Show me a person who is going to go through some Go code or TypeScript or whatever and say, oh, you wanted the three, three VMs, one subnet in and three VPCs and do that in a relatively short period of time, right? I don't think that, that such a person exists. It's so much easier 
to take a look at YAML, JSON, HCL, whatever format you want, declarative, and say, I understand what you want. Right? Now, whether you're going to generate that output one way or another, I'm not so passionate about, right? So, yes, I want declarative finals output. I don't care how you get to it. And that is me saying that without what's fo what follows. And what follows is that for the vast majority of cases, not all, majority of cases, if you need to define something in such a complex way that you need to write it in TypeScript, Go, whatever you're using, you're working at the wrong level of abstraction, right? You need to think about whether that interface that you're using should be as is or should be changed. That's my two cents. There you go. Trash me now. I unfortunately have to primarily agree with you. Going back to what we were talking about earlier, the Helm file, the last thing I want to do is write a Helm file by hand. Yep. I use CDKs a lot, right? And CDKs is anything but declarative, right? I write using CDKs some stuff in Go, but the output of that is Git, and that's what's stored in, uh, sorry, output is YAML, and that's what's stored in Git. That's what is propagated, in my case, to Kubernetes clusters. That's what people can review and so on and so forth, right? And the second thing important is that I use CDKs to create layers of abstractions. I'm not forcing others to use CDKs as well. So when I'm creating those layers of abstractions saying, hey, this is what you should do to get something. So think of me as in this context being a platform engineer. When I create, I use CDKs, I create YAML, I propagate that, that to the cluster and so on and so forth. But then everybody else doesn't have to use CDKs or whatever else you're using because they're getting something meaningful in 20 lines of YAML, HCL, whatever. So if I would translate that, let's say that I'm not doing Kubernetes, I'm using Terraform, right? It would be perfectly valid for me to generate Terraform modules using something, Go. But then all those who will be interacting with those services, creating those services, they will use that module, they will use HCL. And I created a module so that their HCL is not complex, right? And if there is no complexity, then I cannot imagine anybody would argue against declarative, writing declarative format directly. You can't argue with that. <laughs> I just can't. I, I was expecting a fight. I wanted to be the first one to kind of like put you in defense mode. And now you're saying uh, you don't, you cannot argue with that. Come on. Well, and we're getting close to the end too. So I can't fight too much. Here's the thing though. At the end of the day, all the processes are reading flat files in some way, shape or form. Correct? Exactly. A YAML is a flat file, a whatever. It's being ingested into whatever the process is. So if we're doing dynamic or programmatic, it's just a flat file generator. We're back to the 70s, creating CSVs or fixed length files. Yeah, but I think that that's where we agree. That's the final output, no matter yeah. how you get to it, right? Yeah. I as far as I, as long as I don't have to deal with JavaScript, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. So anyway, this was a quick review or semi not quick review of looking at the ThoughtWorks radar number 28 and a failed attempt to fight at the end. So I'll find another opportunity, man. I'm sure we will. We hope this episode was helpful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, please reach out to us. Our contact information and a link to the Slack workspace are at devopsparadox.com slash contact. If you subscribe through Apple Podcast, be sure to leave us a review there. That helps other people discover this podcast. Go sign up right now at devopsparadox.com to receive an email 
whenever we drop the latest episode. Thank you for listening to DevOps Paradox. DevOps Paradox.